Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the second day of Future of Fintech 2020. I'm Tanea McKeel, one of your MCs this year. And before we get the show on the road, I have a couple of things I got to tell you about. First of all, we have a lot of content to share over the next two days, and we want you to know that each session is recorded and will be available for viewing right here after the event concludes. Secondly, today at 1130 Eastern, we have something special for you, our Global Innovation Challenge, in which our top five finalists will be presenting their solutions to global fintech problems to our panel of judges and to you, our audience. So at the end, you will be able to vote along with the judges for our winner. So definitely don't miss that. And lastly, uh, today we launch our FinTech Trivia Day. So I hope you brushed up on your trivia last night. Throughout the day, I'll ask some questions. To participate, you all reply in the chat box to the right of the screen. And the CB Insights events team will take the first five correct answers and email you about claiming your prize. For our first question, since it's a very exciting day for Bitcoiners following the price, what year was Bitcoin first created? What year was Bitcoin first created? The first five correct answers in the chat box win. And without further ado, here's our first session of the day, which is a conversation between uh, myself and Finicity co-founder and CEO, Steve Smith. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. My name is Tanea McKeel. I am a business journalist and anchor covering fintech based in New York City. And I am happy to be sitting here with Steve Smith, CEO and co-founder of Finicity. Steve, thanks so much for joining me today. I'm going to dive right in because we only have 25 minutes to start. For anyone who's not familiar, what is Finicity? Who does it serve? And what problem is it that you're trying to solve? Yeah, so Finicity is um, an open banking platform. And what we're really doing is uh, providing the infrastructure necessary for consumers to permission access to their financial data primarily uh, for use in a number of different financial services, including um, fintech apps like uh, 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 things that would help you manage your money, uh, PFMs or wealth management solutions, uh, you know, person to person payment solutions to uh, lending solutions where you'd provide your information to either help augment your uh, credit score or automate the under underwriting process for getting it. And okay. obviously, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> uh, fine, let me just uh, let me just finish uh, the question. So who does it really serve? Obviously, it's serving the financial community by opening breaking down walls and barriers to data access and and providing a very seamless method for consumers to be able to share uh, their information. Uh, and Finicity essentially is that middle middle uh, platform that allows a consumer to permission access to the data, but then we also collect, curate the data and provide it for those different, for those different use cases. Uh, and often analytics together with that, that help provide additional insights uh, with respect to the data. So it really is a full, a full feature that breaks down the barriers to data access and really provides rich uh, solutions for the use of that data. Right. So hugely important for anyone that wants to use apps of any kind, but the end users may not necessarily be directly familiar with you guys. Um, how do you guys make money? If you can share anything about your business model um, and give us a sense of, you know, how many customers you have, how many different revenue streams and how many customers in each. Um, tell us a little about that. Yeah, broadly, you know, it's an API based service. And so you think about it from that perspective, if, if, if it's a, uh, if it's an enterprise that we're providing services to, it would be based upon volume or based upon some kind of subscription. And we we generally bifurcate our services, uh, microservices into three three categories. Uh, one, uh, the the credit decisioning world, so helping to helping to facilitate uh, digital lending, uh, if you will. And 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 in that particular case, we're often providing a report, a verification of income, or or of assets or employment that that you know we may we may actually you know um, charge uh, for that service on a report basis, uh, kind of a trans uh, on a transaction basis, or we may be providing a, a subscription to ongoing data access where it's just a monthly charge that provides you know ongoing access to a stream of of, of data or insights for for a particular consumer. Uh, on the uh, on the payment side, in generally in that in that case, we're providing information that would help do help facilitate an ACH transfer. So, 
information needed to queue up a, a direct account based um, payment. Um, and that's generally done on a, on, on a per instance basis. And then there may be ongoing access in that particular case as well. And then for, for uh, services like uh, financial management, PFM, or personal financial management or wealth management, in that case, uh, usually the providers of those services are looking for an ongoing subscription or stream of information. So the, the consumer wants you know, daily, daily access to their data in that particular service. And that typically is, uh, is charged on a, on a monthly subscription basis based on all right, um, so lots of different areas. Uh, what areas of FinTech specifically have you seen um, more affected or less even by COVID, by COVID, by COVID-19? Um, you know, I'm interested in hearing about how this pandemic has affected you guys at Finicity, but I think a lot of that also has to do with some of the things that your customers have been experiencing as a result of this pandemic this year. Um, anything top of mind? Oh, a lot of things, obviously. I mean, from from the view of financial services, like COVID has really accelerated the move to digital, and yeah. something by as much as three to five years. And so, when you say you know the future of fintech, we're kind of living it right now because COVID kind of threw it right right. You know what we were talking about a year ago, uh, you know, being two or three or maybe four years out. We're we're in this place right now where. You know, in many cases, if I want to open an account, I need to do it online. I'm not going to the branch. Or if if it was a loan that I would generally sit in front of a loan officer and do an application for, I'm not I'm not doing that. I'm doing it online. And you know, if there's uh, additional information that's needed for verification, it's not like I'm running down the street and handing it off. Um, I'm doing that in a very digital format and. And if I need to bank, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it on my mobile. If I, you know, so people who were never doing mobile deposits before are doing mobile deposits for the first time. People who have never opened a bank account digitally are opening bank accounts digitally. And so what I would say is that we're, we're, uh, everyone in the in the financial technology space has been impacted by the fact that the the, the, the usage is significantly higher than uh, than it was at this time last year. And some of us were ready, and uh, and some of us were more ready than others, and some weren't as prepared as others. And so you think about the the impact to our customers. You know, those that were really prepared have been able to scale much more quickly than they would have been able to do otherwise, uh, because they weren't as dependent on you know manual processing, et cetera. Those that were less prepared have really struggled to to deal with the onslaught of additional volume from a digital perspective, and have had to really move uh you know resources around significantly in the last several months to kind of meet that uh demand to uh working together with the customers where the customers need to meet them and so that those those would be some of the impacts i think the big benefit though to the consumer is that these services largely are provide less friction uh they're 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 quicker they're more convenient uh, and I think they provide a lot more context and um, uh, and ease of use uh, generally. I think just the the overall experience for the consumer is better than 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 in a non digital format, right? So I think good with with some challenge and certainly tons of opportunity. So um, do you think that the industry has been able to keep up? Because, like you said, you know digital has accelerated by years, but you know, the the need to accelerate that is different from actually being able to adapt. So we see all of these consumers want to have more digital financial services. Um, and from where you sit, has the industry been successful at keeping up? And are there any challenges that it's run into trying to keep up with that pace? Yeah, I, you know, I think I think largely the, the answer to that question is yes, the industry has been able to, to do a good job keeping up. Uh, do you know have have we been able to provide the the the, the really rich uh, and powerful uh, experiences from a consumer perspective that we'd like to maybe maybe not a few fits and starts there 
where if we'd have been a little further down the road, maybe that would have been a little smoother. Maybe some of the integration points would have been worked out a little bit better because financial services are complex. Generally, you have a number of parties involved in providing any one kind of financial transaction, like a mortgage, for example. Or if I were to count up all the organizations that are involved in a single in a, in a single lending transaction it you know it's it's extraordinary and having all of those pieces fit together seamlessly takes a lot of work a lot of a lot of preparation but that said mortgage volume has been you know has 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 been higher you know in the last uh, in the last 8 months brought on by not not just covid but also low interest rates so you know in that particular vertical you know those those mortgage lenders that were really digital first uh, have 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 responded exceptionally well, and others have struggled to keep up with the volume, and kind of scale their businesses based on the fact that they're working remote and they require a lot of uh, a lot of eyes on, right? And, and so. All right. Um. What I guess would your response be to? to some of the things that have occurred. So um, I'm thinking of glitches, outages, like what happened at Chime and Galileo earlier this year. What would your, um, I guess, advice be to your customers and to, your, to the industry at large about how to manage that at this time and how to communicate with customers? I think that transparency is the best is is always the best uh, approach in terms of communicating with customers and working together with customers. Uh, an understanding from you know really really working to understand what your customer needs in terms of of response times and volumes as well as 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 communicating back to your customers you know some of the things that you're working through to ensure that you're able to meet those volumes response times etc i mean everybody is growing and uh, uh, that that means that you're moving to new levels of new new levels of uh, you know exercises and 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 scaling platforms and 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 the like and and um, you know i'd like to say as, as as much as i'd like to say that that's uh, Always perfect and without glitches. It's 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 not, and sometimes there are issues. Uh, I think to, to the extent that you can you can work closely with your partners and and communicate well with your partners and understand impacts to their business. That's a that's a really then just being as proactive as possible to understand what the needs are is is super helpful. But uh, listen, when you grow at the at the at the pace the industry is growing right now. You're going to run into a few things, and and uh, I think that you know next month is better than this month, and and uh, we're just taking on taking on a lot more uh, a lot more volume, a lot of different additional services. So, okay, um, I do want to come back to this uh, shortly, but I just want to pivot a little bit because you guys had some exciting news over the summer. You agreed to sell to Mastercard. Um, I know there's very official stuff going on. So you might be a little tight lipped about this, but from what can you, from what you can tell us, why is this agreement an important step for you guys and for MasterCard, obviously, but I think more importantly for the end users and for the people that are current Finicity customers, why does that agreement matter? Yeah. So, so I can, I can say a few things. Uh, first of all, the, the, the uh, the transaction hasn't closed yet, and that's why you know to your point, uh, you know there are some things that it can't can't say too much about. But and it's it's uh, it's it's still uh, being uh, or it's under regulatory review. So we anticipate that it'll uh, that'll close by the end of the year. Uh, but when you take a look at when you take a look at the transaction in and of itself, you look at Mastercard and their footprint. Mastercard is a company, a highly reputable organization that's been working with banks. Uh, worldwide has a great reputation for uh, for providing very hardened technology that uh, that works, you know, in over 200 countries and and uh, facilitates the process of connecting. It connects uh, consumers together with merchants, together with banks, uh, for the process of of uh, facilitating you know commerce and and uh, and then you know as they as mastercard has looked at at what the future looks like really for financial services they've looked very carefully at open banking and what what role open banking will play in the future of 
of financial services. And they they believed early on that open banking would be very asen- a very in- essential component of of uh, powering the next generation of financial services and solutions. And so they began uh, investing, you know, a number of years ago in Europe, Europe, Europe um, in, in open banking, other, other open banking platform solution sets. And, and so the, the acquisition for them really represents an opportunity to, to work closely with an open banking platform here in North America um, and to continue their, their leadership in that way and to continue to leverage e- their kind of leadership in that way. For uh, Finicity, it really represents the opportunity to take, you know, what we have done successfully here in North America to grow it further and to expand beyond the the, the reach of, of, of our, our, you know, our solutions here in, in North America and, and, uh, and really take this concept of uh, consumer permissioned access to data and, and all the different use cases that can be provided uh, through that open banking platform, uh, you know, much more uh, and, and make it And so, um, you know, in, in that case, it's a, it's a great technology solution set uh, with, with uh, success in a particular market working together with a uh, kind of uh, uh, organiza- highly reputable organization financial services that can, that can really expand. Um, you know the utilization of of that technology and solution, and and to the consumer, what it really means is, listen, it's a, a, open banking is really about driving a much higher degrees of financial inclusion. Um, not only here in the U.S., where we're doing things interesting things around, you know, scoring and trying to reach out to the the thin file and credit invisibles, but also outside the the U.S., where extending you know the the capabilities of of uh, financial sort of being able to be included within standard financial services really means the difference between you know my ability to to be involved in standard commerce and have access to low cost capital and not and finding myself on the outside of that and so you know the power of what that can generate on the world from a financial services perspective is uh, is is very cool um Let's talk a little bit about competition. And um, as you mentioned, there is still some stuff under review. Um, and I, you know, d- this does work with me here. This does not have to be about the Finicity MasterCard deal. A similar acquisition um, was agreed to between Visa and Plaid earlier this year. That one is also under investigation. But I think even without these deals, I would ask the question because. Visa and Plaid have been, uh, Visa and Plaid, pardon me, Visa and MasterCard have been so good about partnering with fintechs to, as you say, advance financial inclusion and make things better for the end user. What would happen if Visa and MasterCard gobbled up all of the data aggregators? Um, what would that mean for competition for, you know, newer startups that want to do similar things or newer startups that, um, require similar services to what you provide um, that want to come in, what would the impact be on them? Well, you know, number, no, number one, I think that you'd have to look at um, what's the, what's the potential of that. There is, there is a fair bit of competition in that space and, and uh, services like Finicity have been around for quite some time. Um, you know, we've, uh, Finicity's, uh, uh, been been in the market for a couple of decades, and there are others as you know others as well, and and so that's that's a pretty broad spectrum of of solution sets. The other thing that I would say is that as we move into a much more industry led, you know, um, uh, so much much more industry led solution in around uh, uh, and standards around uh, open banking. Um, yeah, that means that anyone who wants to develop a connection to the bank and negotiate a relationship with the bank can get access to data on a consumer permission to basis from the bank. And so there are lots of lots of different ways to get access. Um, and there are some fintechs going directly to banks and working directly with them and not working through a, a Finicity or a Plaid or, or a Yodley or any one of the other um, uh, aggregators that are out there. And so what I would say is that open banking is large enough and pervasive enough 
that that really the the train has left the station and these solutions are going to be out there i think that you know uh, companies like finicity and like uh, plaid and and others in the space provide convenience and assistance just like in any market where you have a very long tail of you know thousands of, of fintech developers that that might find it easier of course to work through somebody who aggregates all those sources of data together versus you know um, putting together their own uh, connections with banks and that's part of the value proposition but 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 nonetheless you know as this becomes much more uh, pervasive throughout not only North America but the world on the world stage you're gonna have a lot of players in the space and and uh, naturally some leaders and some laggards but but I don't, I, I don't I don't see this as any one player uh, being able to to uh, to have a substantial impact on the market. So um, how does the industry look to you in the short, middle and long term? Do you think that there's going to be more consolidation when, if so, why? Um, near middle long term what does it look like to you yeah i think that i i think that in any industry you know um if you look at if you look at the early going in an industry there are a lot of players that come in and they they come at at solutions technology and innovation from very different views um you know their lens is often uh, related to either a particular use case or a particular a particular set of experiences or a particular vertical that they're thinking about. Uh, over time, is you know, in in a new space, as innovation continues to take place and you get to a higher and larger scale, you you naturally kind of find your way to some degree of consolidation in in most industries. And I I believe that that'll be the case certainly for financial technology. That that'll you know you'll continue to see uh, degrees of of, uh, of of consolidation over time. But what I would also say is that I really believe that we're in our infancy in financial technology. Even though we've been using that term now for what seven, eight, nine years, mm -hmm. um, uh, Finnovate's been around for you know a while, and fintech and the future of fintech and all of these new you know this this is all relatively new, and so. Because it's nascent, uh, I think that we're just in the early, the early going. You're going to see a ton of innovation. Companies not even yet started, uh, you know, additional innovations from existing companies. And I really believe that we're on the, the, the just the, 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 the very beginning, you know, of a, of, of a couple of decades that are going to be really exciting in this space. So if we're still in our infancy, what is going to take us to the next stage or what is going to propel that next stage? To I think the, real, the, real, the real thing there is uh, um, developing some standards. I think that regulators are going to have to take a step in, in helping to create some guide rails and perhaps remove some, some, uh, some, some um, uncertainty in certain areas uh, around data, data access and the, and, and the right. Of, of consumers, um, you know, creating creating standards for quickly and easily, you know, uh, cons and consistently accessing data in standard data types and elements. I mean, it's a, in, industry standards, anytime that you're dealing with a world of interconnectivity, uh, uh, standards are often very helpful in, in uh, you know, uh, creating a, a uh, a rich environment for innovation, and so I think that that's what's uh, that that's what's honestly going to help propel things going forward. Everything is so new right now um, that there are you know there are hundred different ways to think about open banking and and the context of open banking. I think that uh, you know as we continue to move things forward, we're going to continue to get closer to standard approaches. That becomes table stakes, you know, and then we can really focus on the next layer of innovation and solutioning the data and what the data can help um, create for consumers. Okay, we have one minute left before we need to get to our game. So um, I do want to ask one follow up question to that and we'll just speed through it. But I've been covering fintech since about 2014. And maybe this is to your point that we're still in the industry's infancy. But I feel like we've been talking about, you know, standards for data for, for creating and honing standards for data for a really long time. 
what kind of progress have we made and how far are we from getting to where we need to be in terms of setting standards? Yeah, so, you know, Finicity, together with a number of other companies, founded the Financial Data Exchange. Well, that was announced two years ago, um, uh, October 18th, two years ago, but it but was two years in the making prior to that. Um, and in, in that two years, 153 companies have signed on as members, and there are several working groups and a number of different uh, use cases have been defined. And so, you know, 20 years ago, Bluetooth had its start. And for six years, you know, there wasn't a ton going on, but if you take a look now, you got billions of devices interconnected through Bluetooth standards and it's 20 years old, two decades, right? So I think you'll look back a, a decade and a half from now and you'll look at the standards and you'll say, yeah, well, that all made perfect sense. And that's what was required. And we were all really smart then. All right. We have one minute left to blow through this game. Three terms, overrated, underrated. Let's start with Venmo. Uh, appropriately rated. Sorry, that wasn't a, a yeah. I, I think that, uh, yeah, big, uh, big solutioning, person to person, really great. Okay. Blockchain. Uh, a little before it's time. So uh, I think it'll be important technology. It'll play out really well and it'll be really helpful in financial services, but we're a little early. Okay. Teen focused and family banking. Yeah, I think important, but uh, you know, the, you also have the issue of uh, teens not wanting to be incredibly focused on finding anyway, and so really simple solutions around around uh, uh, banking for teens, I think, is super important. Uh, but I think it has to be. I, I think you have to put it in the right box and framework. Okay, Steve Smith, Finicity CEO, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, I really appreciate it.